Our final law that we talk about today is Newton's third law. Newton's third law uh, speaks to the idea that forces come in pairs. So think about it. If you kick a boulder, right, it's on the ground, big heavy thing, and you kick it, you experience some pain. <laughs> Uh, because you exert a force on this boulder, it may or may not be enough to move it because its mass is so great that it might not have much resulting acceleration, if any, because there's also the friction going on to talk about. Uh, but your foot hurts after kicking it because the boulder exerts a force back on you. This is the force of the boulder on foot. And this is the force of foot on boulder. Uh, the boulder isn't an inanimate object. It's not alive. It's not um, just getting upset that you hit it and choosing to you know, hit you back. This is just a, a law of nature. It doesn't matter that the boulder is inanimate. It exerts a force back on you. So Newton's third law states that if a body A, that would be our foot here, body A in this case, exerts a force on body B, that would be an action, right? So this is the action. And really it's, uh, it's this is the action. Right? force of the foot on the boulder is the action, then body B also exerts a force on body A, and that's the reaction. Reaction. These two forces have the same magnitude, but opposite direction. Right? Same magnitude, but opposite direction. And these forces act on different bodies. And that one is very key. So the force of the foot on the boulder, it's on the boulder, right? So the force is acting on the boulder. Whereas the force of the boulder on the foot, it's acting on the foot. This turns out to be key to solve a conundrum that often comes up with uh, upon first learning about Newton's three laws. So symbolically, we have the force of a on B is equal to the negative of the force of B on A. In simpler terms, every action, in other words, force, has an equal and opposite reaction. The reaction is also a force. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Forces come in pairs. Uh, again, it doesn't matter that the boulder is inanimate. It exerts a force. So it's usually not useful to label, like I did here, both action and reaction pairs uh, when, when solving problems, when making force diagrams, um, because usually you only care about the motion of one of the objects. Usually the problem would be either asking about where the, the boulder goes or where the foot goes, right? The motion of one or the other. Or if it's asking about both, you need to consider them separately because they're two different bodies. And so on the same free body diagram, the force diagram, uh, you will not have considerations of forces on two different objects. You will only be considering one object at a time per diagram. Um, but it is nevertheless imperative to remember that they exist, right? That they exist. Uh, so if we have a table here, full table legs, and that's a surface, so I'll do this. Okay. And we have some box. This box. Uh, is being 
it has a force being exerted on it by gravity. It's a gravitational force. Right? And so what that means is there's a force pushing down on the table due to gravity. If there was no gravity, it would just be floating there. And Newton's first law comes into play. Object at rest, objects at rest tend to stay at rest. Um, so, so we have gravity pulling it down against the table. If the table were not exerting any force back upwards on it, it would be crashing through the table, right? It would be compressing the table downwards. And of course, we know that that is not happening. Objects sit on tables all the time. So, uh, to rewrite this, right? There's a force on the table, force of the block, block on table, and just do B on T, on T. So forces come in pairs. So because of this force of the block on the table, the table then exerts a force back up on the block. So this is the force of T on B. Um, and that is equal to the normal force. That's where the normal force comes from. If there were no normal force, it would only be the gravity force downwards, right? So it would be crashing through the table. But again, on the same diagram here, we've done what we should not do when trying to solve problems in order to, to just hammer this point. We've done it, but you should not uh, put this into practice. We've done forces on the table in the same diagram as forces on the block, right? So we should not ordinarily do that. We would consider one or the other individually. All right, so let's bring this back in. All right, give us some new room here. So the conundrum that I referred to earlier that confuses people when they encounter Newton's third law, or three laws, especially by the time they get to the third one, is uh, you just told me that every force is countered. It has a pair, didn't you? You told me forces come in pairs. So for every force, there's an equal and opposite reactive force. Why does anything move ever? If every force is countered, so to speak, why does anything move? Why isn't everything stationary? This can't be how it works. You must be wrong, Joel. Uh, well, consider what Newton's second law describes and what Newton's third law describes. Newton's second law, F equals MA, remember? Newton's second law, F equals M. A, and specifically the sum of these forces, right? It's a vector, and it's a vector. It only applies to forces acting on a given body. It doesn't apply to forces uh, acting on other bodies, right? So the acceleration of a given body is equal to the vector sum of the forces on that body, right? Newton's third law. tells us, and this is the equal and opposite law that we're going over here, right? Equal and opposite. Well, that's very useful to uh, and worthwhile to remember this stuff. Tells us uh, about different bodies acting on each other. So we have a ball and a foot. Right? Two different bodies. And so there's one force that we're talking about on a ball and another one on a foot. 
So if this is the only forces, we're not considering gravity or friction or drag force or any of the other forces that might come into play here, and we're only considering these forces, then if we were doing uh, an analysis of the motion for this ball, the net force is equal to this one, right? The net force is equal to, we'll just say F uh, ball, F ball. And that's equal to the mass of the ball times the acceleration of the ball. So it experiences a net force. And so therefore it experiences an acceleration and it experiences motion, velocity. And then here, for the foot, the net force, if we were analyzing the foot as our primary uh, object here, that's equal to, we'll call this one, F foot, <laughs> right? F foot, and that would be the ball on the foot. And this is really the foot on the ball. So this is the force acting on the foot, and that's equal to the mass of the foot times the acceleration of the foot. So it also experiences some acceleration due to the force and its own mass, and it also experiences some velocity. So things do move. There's no conundrum between Newton's second law and Newton's third law. Equal and opposite does not mean that every force is countered and nothing should move. You're talking about two different bodies with Newton's third law. Whereas Newton's second law is saying, well, the sum of all the forces on a given body, a single body, determines its motion. Yeah. Um, and of course, if the ball didn't weigh very much, this uh, would be a small acceleration. And if the foot weighed a lot, it would be a large acceleration, right? So it describes its motion. Um, so. Uh, it's kind of also useful <laughs> to point out, speaking of conundrums, um, if I had a little ball, like say a tennis ball, I don't know how to draw a tennis ball exactly, but a little tennis ball, and I bounced it on the ground, it bounces, and then it comes back up to almost the same height, right? So when it hit the ground, it of course exerts a force on the earth. And the, exerts, uh, the, the earth therefore exerts a force back on it, and that's what moves it back up. Well, the reason that the ball bounces and the earth seems to stay stationary, aside from the fact that you're standing on the earth, and so if it moves, you might move, is the fact that the masses are so great. So the forces are the same, it's equal and opposite. There is a force of the ball on the earth and that is equal to but in opposite direction the force of the earth on the ball. So how come the ball dumps all the way back up whereas the earth stays stationary? Well these forces right so it's equal to the mass so the ball on the uh, earth is equal to the mass of, of earth times the, uh, the acceleration that the earth feels, right? So the earth's resulting acceleration this is equal to the inverse of the mass of the ball times the acceleration of the ball. Well, mass, uh, the mass of the Earth, Earth's mass is very, very, very large, huge, big M, whereas the mass of the ball is very small, it's just a little m. So the forces are the same, and so therefore the accelerations will act, uh, will change proportionally. So the acceleration of the Earth, it's not zero, it's absolutely not zero, because the force is not zero, and the mass is not infinite, um, so the Earth does move when you bounce a ball, when you jump up and down on, on the ground. The Earth is moving just very, 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 very slightly. It's unnoticeable. And the ball, or your body, right, uh, moves up greater. 
All right, so next we talk about free body diagrams and kind of summarize everything we've talked about here.